Welcome back. This is Chris Richter from ricochet.com.au and today is a bit of a walk down memory lane plus a look at interactive content. Now, when I say walk down memory lane, I was involved many, many years ago in a lot of development for education content using a player called Flash. And I don't don't know if you remember those games you used to be able to play on your phone years ago. Now, those puzzle games and interactive content or interactive games that you could play uh, designed to run on your phone using a product called Adobe Flash or Flash Player. And we used to create all of these interactive content components that went into education materials many years ago. And that all sort of disappeared when the Flash Player disappeared and was no longer available on specifically iPhones. Uh, Then it moved to everything else and became something that you just don't really use that much anymore. So sort of disappointed about all of that sort of thing disappearing because a lot of education or a lot of the value in education can be things that are more interactive. So the student isn't just consuming content, they're actually involved in the content. So what I thought I would do is show you a couple of the things that we did many years ago and then give you a look at some of the things that we have currently done uh, that can make your content, your education content, a bit more interactive. So let's just jump and have a quick look at some of those things back from many years ago. So one of the ones we did quite a few years ago, and this was a, a product uh, for apparel merchandising, and it was it was actually pretty cool. So you can see here the, the promo information sheet is uh, dated back in 2013. Um, but what we did there is we created uh, just a web-based bit of content a web-based program that allows students to sort clothing in colors and orders and positions and do all sorts of interactive um, activities that allowed them to learn about apparel merchandising. And this was designed to run on iPads and um, you know mobile devices, so all drag and drop and all that sort of thing. So it was all pre-programmed. It didn't use Flash, uh, which had already disappeared by then, really. Uh, but it was something that students got to interact with and create their layouts and check to see if they were doing things correctly. So they'd read the content and then they'd have a go at something and see if they got that right and could do that correctly. And it wasn't just text based, it was very graphical based and had all the images and pictures and icons and things they could sort and reorder and arrange and uh, really very, very practical. That was one that we had a look at. Another one that we did uh, even earlier than that, back in 2012 and before that, we created a whole virtual island to sit inside uh, the Google Earth player. And this island was a, I see the graphics is very ordinary there. I don't have a really good copy of that to show you, but, um, and it no longer sits on Google Earth, uh, but it was called Mayhem Island and it was used for ecotourism training. Had all sorts of things on the island, uh, including uh, the actual buildings and everything that they used as part of their training. It had uh, all the, you know, plants and animals that lived on this island and where they lived and the whole ecosystem of that island. And it was a fantastic product to use. Hundreds and hundreds of, of photos and pictures of um, obviously real world you know, plants and animals that all belonged there. And it was all set off the east coast of Australia. And uh, that was used for a lot of online education courses. It wasn't just used for the one course. It was used for multiple courses as a way of students jumping in and sort of becoming more involved and interactive and learning about an actual virtual location. So that was a really clever and interesting product that we did. It was a lot of fun to look at. And and one that came before all of the um, you know Zoom meetings and pre-Zoom, pre-everything, it was 2009. We we're actually experimenting with real-time video and we managed to get 12 webcams connected across Australia. So that was on the East Coast uh, down to Tasmania um, South Australia, Western Australia, and then uh, northern, northern New South Wales, so New England area. Uh, we ended up with a product uh, that we were just using as a, an experiment in in virtual, you know, web conferencing. It had a whiteboard; it you could load PowerPoint files into it. Um, all of that doesn't exist anymore because there's all these other commercial platforms that do this. But it was originally Flash based, and we converted that to HTML5. So that was another interesting thing that we did with that. But let's have a bit of a look at what has happened since. Now there's been this big, I, th- I think anyway, this big void in the middle where we haven't had all of that interactive content that's been even remotely, um, I will say interesting, educationally interesting and useful. But 
um, let me show you a few things that have sort of come about more recently. Now, one of those is an automotive course that we've been uh, putting together that you know, needed some sort of animation, but we thought let's make it an interactive animation so at least students can interact a little bit with it. So not real exciting, but useful. So this is just an engine cycling through the process that an engine does, but at least the students can slow it down to see what it looks like with each cycle and what happens in that process. And they can look at that fast. They can stop it where they need to. They can continue on. They can stop again and they can speed it back to, or they can show it fast or they can go back to normal speed. So that's uh, created in Illustrator. So it's a vector image, so it can be zoomed up um, back down again without losing any quality and it still animates at whatever size it runs on mobile devices all that sort of thing so that was sort of very simple another part we had to do was um, demonstrating how electricity works in parallel how parallel circuits work uh, so this one again it's an animation drawn up in illustrator and then into adobe animator i think for this one then the example is there's a few buttons for them to try things out. So if globe one is blown, what happens to the electricity? Where does it go? If globe two is blown, you can see it now goes through globe one, stays alight. If both globes are blown, then the whole thing stops and you get nothing. And then you can reset it. That was just an example. Um, you know, when we say interactive, it's not highly interactive, but it's more practical than trying to write that down in a paragraph or in a couple of paragraphs and have a student understand that concept. So this makes it much easier for them to understand. Uh, another example is this one here. It says select the most dangerous area of the image, and I've already selected that. But if they selected somewhere else, they might have thought he was the most dangerous area, which um, is an interesting question. It comes up with try again, or they click on the exact area or this very large area, which can be resized and it shows correct blade from the saw. Now, when you say interactive, at least the student is making some sort of decision and deciding what they think first and then getting some feedback uh, in a visual way. So that sort of thing is quite useful. Now, another one we worked on is a 3D model. Now, this is using Sketchfab, which is a, a platform that has a whole heap of models in there. And what you can do is you can grab those models and do things with them. And this one is... Uh, the anatomy of dog but we've added in some extra controllers so you can zoom in and zoom out and rotate and do all that sort of thing but the added functions we did with this one because there's all these layers inside the dog uh, or below the dog that you can't really see just by looking at it there so for example if we run to this slider as we make the slider, drag the slider across, it goes through each layer and removes the top layer to show what's underneath. So you can now see where the muscles sit in relation to the dog. Then you can go further down and see where the muscles sit in relation to the bone structure. And keep working your way through and sit and see where all the internal components sit in relation again. So it just keeps going down and down and down and down uh, to remove them all. So that's a, another clever a way of using 3D modeling to interact. But I'm interested in what you think. Do you, do you think it's actually useful? Do we need to put more effort into creating interactive content for users? Now, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of uh, advertising and media and what they're using there now. A lot, of, a lot of it has become more interactive where you know, people get to make choices and give their feedback on what they think uh, when there's you know, an ad isn't just an ad anymore the ad might actually say um, you know here's three options what do you think and then you can choose and you can look at the statistics and go oh, okay that's interesting to see where I fit in between that or I answer questions about myself and it comes back with results which we wouldn't do in education but um, normally but what about things like these animations or or even going back to that um now the electricity model of demonstrating how things work so students can interact with those with those objects and and sort of see what happens when different variables are changed and things are moved. Let me know what you think, because I'd be really interested to see what other people's opinions are and what their, their thoughts are on that type of content, rather than just video and text-based content, which is primarily what's delivered in most educational platforms. I hope that's been useful and you found some of it useful. Uh, be keen to hear from you. I'm Chris Richter. I'll talk to you soon.